Okay, so the first question is, what is an example of a, cur of a package currently in a non-ELPA repo that does not work well with Emacs? Well, one of them is s.el. And this is what made me aware that there was an issue here that caused problems. Well, s.el is a beautifully written package that appears to be very useful for people. And there's just one thing wrong with it. It gobbled up the namespace of symbols starting with s dash. And I was shocked to discover that somebody who had not coordinated with the Emacs developers at all had implemented a package using such a short prefix, which isn't the right way to do things. Oh, by the way, the questions have moved off the screen. This is no good. I can continue answering this one, but I'll be stuck when this one is over. Anyway, so, uh, and I was told that there was nothing I could do about it that so many users packages were using s.el and thus essentially using that definition of the s dash star symbols that any attempt to use them publicly or privately for anything else would lead to horrible problems and i don't like that i decided i wanted to do something a, so that that wouldn't happen again, and B, to make it unhappen in that case. Well, the way to make it unhappen in that case is with a new symbol renaming feature. The idea is you rename that file to something else, and then you define an s.el that sets up symbol renaming and then loads the something else. So it actually runs the same code. It just doesn't globally define the symbols S dash whatever, but they appear to work for the programs that explicitly require that require S .el or the S package. So this gets the same behavior for all the programs that are using that library and uh, doesn't interfere with the global namespace at all. However, to do that, we need to have a package s.el that isn't the same, totally a short file that's totally different. Plus, we've got to have the file that normally is called s.el available, but uh, under another name. Well, how are we going to do that? We can't put this into, into Emacs in a nice way that uh, won't, make the, uh, won't make the maintainer angry of the, the developer of that package. But we can do it with non-GNU ELPA. We can put those two things into non-GNU ELPA without any difficulty. And this shows one of the advantages we can put files, we can put packages into non-GNU ELPA and make changes in them. Now, in general, we wouldn't go to the effort of making big changes. That's just too much to do unless something's really important. But small changes that help things fit in are easy to do. And, uh, okay, oh, so basically the recording didn't get anything until now. I just saw... A, a note pop up. This session is now being recorded. I hope it's been recorded all along. It would be a shame to spoil. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, that's one of the issues. Uh, does non GNU ELPA already exist, or is this a sort of quote plan? I don't know why you have to put scare quotes around the word plan. It's sort of in between. It, the creation of it is started. You will find that there is an archive that it's possible to download packages from, and there is a repository to put them in, but that's not the way it's really supposed to work. Uh, 
this is not supposed to be like GNU ELPA where there's one repo for all the packages and thus anyone who wants to edit any of them, anyone that we want to have edit any of them has got to have access to the whole thing. For one thing, some packages will make an arrangement with the developers and they'll assure us that they will do things as things should be done and then we'll have their repo copied automatically or in other cases say copied manually with a little checking every so often uh, and then uh, in other cases we'll need to have our own repo for a particular package but we shouldn't have a single repo for all the packages. We should have a repo for each package so that the people working on that can get access to modify it. This has to be finished setting up and we're still working out the procedures, for instance, for making the arrangements with the developers of a package so that we can, we hope, uh, entrust its development to them and uh, rely on them directly. And there may be more that needs to be worked on. Uh, there's so many questions. Well, I hope you, the third question is what are the benefits? I hope that people now see the benefits. I've described them. Uh, Next question, is it possible to work with the MELPA team to integrate that into Emacs? No, because the goal doesn't make sense. MELPA, the way it's done, does not belong inside Emacs in any sense. Well, first of all, it can't literally be inside Emacs. We don't have copyright assignments for that code, and to get it uh, would be unfeasible. But we're not asking for copyright assignments for non-GNU ELPA. So that's, you might wonder, could MELPA be merged with non-GNU ELPA? The problem is MELPA doesn't modify the packages. It's just a place to find releases of packages wherever they happen to be. And they put packages in with only a little bit of checking. So, no, we, there are a lot of packages that are in MELPA that we'd like to get into non-GNU ELPA. I don't know the names of most of them, but I expect most of them would be fine to have. But they've got to be looked at one by one. There are some rules for non-GNU ELPA, and the only way to check them is to check them on one package at a time. And that's going to take effort. Now, if the people who work on MELPA want to get involved with this, that would be great. I haven't tried asking them. First, we've got to get this thing set up. I doubt they would want to, but if they said yes, that would be wonderful. Uh, any thoughts of packages being added? I'm afraid. Um, I'm afraid. Any thoughts of packages being added as some URL I don't know anything about, but it talks about open source, which means I'm very unlikely to have much in common with whatever they say about either licensing or what's right and wrong. Uh, but they, it seems to be something about disregarding licenses altogether. Well, that is basically asking to lose. There are reasons why we developed GNU licenses to release software, why we have criteria for which licenses make a program free software. If the program doesn't carry a license, or if it carries a non-free license, that program is not free software. Now, you can 
maybe get away with disregarding that fact uh, unless somebody, an author or publisher, stops you. But we're not going to take, we're not basically going to disregard the question of whether the software we recommend to people really is free software or not. That's basically uh, blindfolding yourself to the legal situation of the software you're distributing. It's a terrible idea. Uh, if they disregard our licenses, they will hear from us about it. And if you want to contribute to the free world, put free licenses on your code and choose good ones. To get this information, look at gnu.org slash licensing, in sorry, slash licenses. And one page that in that's important is license dash recommendations.html. That's where we advise you on what license we would recommend you use depending on the circumstances. There's also license-list.html, which describes a lot of licenses and says which ones are free, which ones are compatible with the GNU GPL. It's really important to use only GPL compatible licenses so that the various programs can be combined together or linked. And uh, you can also get other information about GNU licenses and the reasons why they are written the way they are. Uh, sorry, I don't see the next question. Uh, why do I insist on using per and pers? Uh, I'm not happy with using they, which is a plural pronoun, with a singular antecedent. It's bad because it causes confusion that is completely gratuitous many sentences become a lot of work to parse and understand if you add that ambiguity, that source of, amb of regular ambiguity. Now, I do not accept the demands of other people in regard to changing my grammar. You can try to convince me, but no one is entitled to give me orders about that or state their desires and expect obedience, not from me and not from you or anyone. We are all equally entitled to decide how we will speak and how we won't speak. Now, I've spelled out all of these points in a file called uh, stolman.org slash articles slash uh, gender neutrality dot html. Of course, this is not a GNU project policy. Uh, it's my own personal ideas on the subject. If any of you feels offended by my referring to you with a singular gender neutral pronoun, feel free to ex contact me privately and explain to me your reasons. I will pay attention to them. I'll think about them, assuming that they're not something I've already considered and uh, decided to dismiss before. But you must not speak to me as if I had no business not obeying you, because that's rude, and it is not likely to convince me to change my mind. I believe it is not actually a stating offense to anyone, and the fact that somebody disagrees with me does not mean I'm wrong but I always can be wrong.
When you wrote that, you could add a package to non-GNU ELPA. Are you implying that you would add packages with or without package maintainers knowledge? Of course. The packages we would, we would distribute in this way are free software. Everyone is entitled to redistribute them, and everyone is also entitled to modify them and redistribute them. That's part of the meaning of free software. I have been unable to understand how there came to be an idea that those who redistribute packages have some idea to be mere mirror, some obligation to be mere mirrors and not modify things themselves. Well, if a package is being maintained by developers who are cooperating with us, we'll normally just leave it to them. After all, we have lots of other work to do. They are clearly experts on the packages they've developed. Let's leave it to them if they make that sort of arrangement with us. But that's up to them. We can't insist that anyone make an arrangement with us, but since those programs are free software, anyone is free to redistribute them, and we will do that. Uh, have you ever used VI or Vim or evil mode? No. Are there any plans to implement security considerations in non-GNU ELPA? Uh, we probably should, and this will have to be implemented. Uh, at the moment, developer Emacs maintainers will copy packages into it. And so uh, as long as they are verifying the packages and getting the packages from the right place, that will take care of the security. Once there is, when with automatic copying in, we'll have to do something to make sure that we're fetching the packages securely. And uh, some of you might be interested in helping to design and implement this system. Uh, what distro do I use? Uh, well, which distro of GNU slash Linux do I use? I use Treescale. I haven't tried most of the free distros. And the reason is, it's not crucial that I do so. We don't need me to rate the various free distros on practical questions, because anyone can do that as well as I can. And uh, so, you can tell people what you think of using them. For me, what's important to me is to inform people of the difference between the free distros and the non-free distros, making sure people are aware that if you install a non-free GNU slash Linux distro, you'll get a free operating system with non-free stuff in various quantities added. Thus, you will not reach freedom, although you, you'll make a lot of progress compared with using, for instance, Windows or Mac OS or whatever vicious thing it might be. I'd like, to, I'd like to people to be aware of this next step towards getting freedom for yourself and your own computing so that you can do that if you want to. Uh, so, who gets to make the final decision regarding non-GNU ELPA? The Emacs maintainers are going to be in charge of this. Uh, because it's not just a technical decision, it has with only technical consequences. But in general, unless there's some severe problem with a package, we will want to put it in. 
And I expect most packages won't have a problem. And we can just put them in when we get to them. Won't the ELPA link to non-free sites like GitHub? Uh, it's a mistake to talk about a non-free site. Because a site is not a program. A program is either free or non-free, and we have clearly stated criteria for that in gnu.org slash philosophy slash free dash sw dot html. We have the free software definition. But a site, well, there are programs on it, but it doesn't make sense to ask whether the site is free or not. It's too simplistic a question to have a meaningful answer. Now, one thing you can ask about is, does the site send JavaScript to the user's machine, to the user's browser? And if so, is that JavaScript non-free? Well, GitHub does send non-free JavaScript for some operations. So we consider it unsatisfactory as a repository. But uh, that doesn't mean linking to it for is a bad thing to do regardless of what the purpose is. For instance, if the purpose is to refer to some things that you can access without running the non-free JavaScript, then it's okay for that purpose. So if now that you understand the details of this issue, you think that there is a problem with the link to camel, there's, sorry, a link in camel.html, well, report it to uh, bug GNU Emacs. Report it as an Emacs bug. But do think about the criteria I've just said because maybe it's not a problem. Is it okay to use the GNU Afero GPL for Emacs packages? Yes, it is. Uh, which is your favorite programming language? If Lisp, which variant? Well, I don't exactly have a favorite variant. Uh, when I designed Emacs Lisp, I did the best thing I could think of at the time, subject to the need to keep it small. For the first few years, it was important for GNU Emacs to run in a machine which could only give it half a meg of user space. So there are a lot of constructs that clearly were desirable to include that I left out because we could make it work without them. And then a lot of those have been added since because it's been a long time since we needed to keep Emacs so rigorously small. Um, someone is asking about uh, the FSF's repository project. Well, we agreed that there would be another virtual machine running one of those for the GNU project. But uh, that's as far as the discussion went. Question 17 is extremely insulting. I have not engaged in sexual harassment. Don't expect me to plead guilty to such a nasty claim. People have been accusing me of many things, some of which are basically molehills and some of which are false. So uh, I'm not going to give them anything. I have been bullied in a horrible way. That was wrong. I would like the bullies to apologize to me
And when I see that they're not bullying, I will forgive them. I would like to have conversations with them. If any of the molehills annoyed someone, I'm happy to talk with Per and thus uh, help, re help resolve things with peace. And my opinion on, quote, diversity within uh, Emacs, well, Emacs is never going to be diverse. It is extended in one language, Emacs Lisp. Well, I don't know. Uh, we did have an idea of implementing extensibility using Scheme, and the hope was that Guile could be integrated with Emacs. That turned out to be difficult. It may be impossible, but in principle, it might be a good thing. That would be a small amount of diversity, but it's not that important. What I think is really important for developing Emacs is to make it do word processing. I sometimes use LibreOffice, and yeah, I can make it do things, it has features for WYSIWYG, which are very nice, but it's in other regards, it's not Emacs and it doesn't have the abilities of Emacs and it should. So I urge people to work on extending Emacs in that direction, adding the features that a word processor has to have. The last question I can answer is 18. Uh, yes, it's a very sad thing how many companies insist on using non-free software. Well, I would get a different kind of job. That's a decision I made many years ago, early in the GNU project. I decided I would not, first of all, I would not get a job developing non-free software. And later on, I decided once I could stop using non-free software, that is, once we had a GNU slash Linux system that we could switch over to and uh, oh, wait, I thought I thought magic wand time meant it was time to stop. <laughs> but now I read the rest of the question. Uh, so what do you do? Well, if I were you, I'd probably not work for any of those companies. If I needed to make money, I'd get a job, but I'd get some other kind of job. One that didn't involve using software. I would, or that let me choose the software I would use. Uh, I would live cheaply. You know, the less you spend, the less you need to make. And the more time you can take away from your paid work, and the more flexibility you have in which paid work you can do. Being in a position to say no, to avoid being desperate to say yes. <clears throat> uh, strengthens your position and you need that. One way you can help do that is by not having children. Now that is a tangent, but it can't be denied that raising children is very expensive. I have heard many people say that they are uncomfortable with their jobs, but they have to do those jobs to make enough money to support their children. Well, think about that. Be aware you, that's likely to happen to you before you make that decision. 
what would I what would I change about free software? Well, <clears throat> since this is magic, I would f magically find a way of showing everyone why most free software needs to be copyleft,ed so that our community would not basically submit to abuse by proprietary software developers. Of course, I could go further if I could magically recruit 100,000 good programmers to do lots of work improving free software. We might, well, if we could do this 20 years ago, we might have wiped out non-free systems. And then we wouldn't have had horrible things like World Wide Web DRM that no one has the courage to resist if they're desperately trying to get money for anything and if they need approval of companies of the big companies that push for drm uh then they don't dare even resist as much as they can resist and look what happened to the world wide web consortium uh they surrendered blatantly and ignominiously by endorsing the DRM system. So what can you do? I don't have a magic wand. I'm a human being with the capabilities I have, but the advantage of great firmness in campaigning for free software and this enables me to do things that no one else will do. What tools from pre-Unix days do you miss? Well, I don't, I don't think about them with missing them, actually. Uh, it was sort of nice to have DDT as your login shell so in using modern terminology because that meant at any time you could stop a program load its debugging symbols and start examining the data in the instructions you could debug it that way and then you could even patch in instructions to continue running that job with the bug fixed in fact you could even do this with the system kernel so that your jobs wouldn't get lost. I did that quite a few times. Of course, sometimes I saw what was wrong and I just had to fix a piece of data. But sometimes it took me a long time to figure out how to get the system to keep on going. But with the work I had done, I didn't want to lose uh, that work. And so one of the first features I put into GNU Emacs was autosave. Uh, I'm not going to try to figure out which packages I, re I actually use. Uh, if I knew I would get hit by a bus tomorrow, uh, say because of a fortune teller? No, a fortune teller doesn't give you any knowledge. It's just superstitious. Uh, hand waving. So, assuming that I talked, that I got a reading from a fortune teller, which is implausible enough to begin with, uh, that wouldn't give me any knowledge about what was going to happen to me. Uh, by the way, fortune tellers generally play back to you facts that they've discovered about you together with cold reading, which means they say things calculated to make it appear that they know more than they do, or things that are, uh, that sound wise to anyone. So you can say the same thing to uh, say 100 people and 80 or 90 of them will say, boy, that was really accurate. 
But what if for some reason uh, about what, what advice would I give for stewardship of Emacs? Well, basically, focus on keeping the community strong in defending freedom. If you have a choice between keeping the community strong in defending freedom and getting more people to participate in the development, you've got to choose the freedom. It is very easy for free software projects to subordinate freedom to other criteria. And once that happens, it's easy for those who don't care much about freedom, such as sometimes companies that might offer you some money, to purchase your soul. Not that there are really things that exist called souls, it's a metaphor, but it's an important metaphor for something important. People in the community have to be thinking about freedom when they make decisions about what is wise to do. The decision to, develop, to set up non-GNU ELPA has a drawback. It was a compromise. Now, a lot of people will tell you that I am uncompromising and say that that's a flaw. Well, they're wrong. I make little compromises uh, very often, and occasionally I make a medium-sized compromise. The compromise is, in the past, we wanted to get copyright assignments for the packages in GNU ELPA so that we could move them into core Emacs. And of course, sometimes we move packages in the other direction. That way, we're where we distribute a given package is something we can decide purely technically. And however, make, insisting on getting copyright assignments for all the packages in GNU ELPA meant that we had to say, sorry, no, we will not install that packages in, package in GNU ELPA unless the authors sign copyright assignments. And sometimes that's a lot of trouble. Well, non-GNU ELPA won't require copyright assignments. If there's a free package, we can make whatever changes, presumably small, otherwise we would probably say uh, we don't have time, uh, and then put it in. But it does have the drawback that, we, in general, we won't be able to move those packages into core Emacs without getting the legal papers then that we didn't get before. How do you see the future of GNU Emacs? Uh, I don't see the future. I used to say that my crystal ball is cloudy today. Unfortunately, that has another meaning, which is quite ironic. Uh, we certainly don't want uh, our lives to be uh, somewhere in a cloud because that clouds your mind and then people start cheating you and taking advantage of you and it's horrible. But uh, I don't see the future. I just can be sure from the past that there will be challenges where some of the people involved want to make a big compromise that isn't worth it. And they, some, they may even get the impression that it's up to them. Well, actually, Emacs has appointed maintainers, just as every GNU package does. And they are the ones in charge of developing that package. And this is for a good reason, because the appointed maintainers take responsibility to carry out the GNU project policies. And most important of all are the ones that make the whole system work together and the ethical standards to respect freedom and defend freedom. Is there any plan to move more packages from core Emacs into ELPA? Uh, 
I don't know uh, if, whether there is a plan. I suppose if there's a plan, we probably would have done it. If there had been a plan, some had been moved. I don't see this as a fundamentally important issue. It's a matter of what's convenient for the users and their advantages and disadvantages to each choice. What is your opinion on higher education uh, requiring non-free software, for instance? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't matric matriculate in a school which did that unless I saw a way I could refuse. Now, of course, I do this because I can get away with it and therefore my doing it is extremely important to, to show somebody does resist. I don't expect most people who support free, who advocate free software to go that far. Uh, I published an article in the spring entitled saying no even once is helping to saying no to non-free software even once because the more you do it the more you help but even doing it a little in a way that other people notice is starting to help so uh please don't think that your choices are either be as firm and stubborn as I am, or just give up and let yourself drift helplessly as if you had no volition. There are a lot of points in between there, and you can surely manage to say no some of the time and show people an example of saying no some of the time. For instance, you could say to people, you know, I hate the fact that my school makes me use Zoom. Uh, so whenever I'm not being forced, I'm not going to use it. Or I hate the fact that the only way I can talk to that group of people is with Zoom. But when, but for anything else, I will feel better about myself if I don't. See, lots of ways to say no some of the time and yield some of the time. And when you try saying no occasionally, you may just develop the ability to say no more often. Now, whether you would ever get to be as stubborn as I am, I don't know. But what I find is that I like the fact that I have never made this kind of compromise. I feel I have a reputation to maintain. Nobody's forcing me, but I get satisfaction out of maintaining, out of being able to continue to say, I will not. You are now unmuted. And that also can happen at various different levels. So you can get that satisfaction of fully maintaining a refusal that applies only to certain areas. Um, since since uh, noon already, let's maybe take one or two more questions and then break for the lunch break. Okay. Thank you. How often do you personally use Emacs is the you lowest you? question now. Uh, well, I use it most of the day. I occasionally do use other things. In fact, I occasionally edit with LibreOffice. I occasionally use media players. I occasionally, uh, uh, I occasionally SSH to a machine and type some commands on it, which occasionally includes running Emacs on it. I read PDF files a lot. Would be nice if you could get those into Emacs so that I could read them with Emacs commands and I maybe even edit them with Emacs commands when they can be edited. I use uh, Xurnal sometimes to uh, write on a PDF file. 
Are there any more interesting projects you have in mind over and above non-GNU ELPA? Uh, I can't think of one right now. Well, there are things there are things that the GNU project needs doing. There are packages that don't have maintainers or could use more maintainers. Uh, talk with maintainers at GNU.org and the assistant GNU senses will uh, help you find a package where you can do good. Not for beginners, though. You got to get. You got to learn uh, a substantive, substantial level of capacity to develop and debug programs before you can be a maintainer. Uh, have I ever looked at Maggot? Uh, no, I haven't. But uh, I believe work is being done to get it put into Emacs, and uh, at that point. I'll give it a try. I do not want to share my configuration files. They're personal. But uh, how about if we end this now? You are now unmuted. Sounds good to me. Thank you very much, Richard, for joining in for live questions. Okay.